Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep. Uh -oh, I can't hear anything. There we go. Okay, how about now? Yep, yeah, we can hear you, Ben. I can hear you too now. How is everybody? Good. Good. Brad said he's going to be a few minutes late. Okay. He'll be on in a second. I'm going to share my screen. How are you, Janet? I'm among the living. Well, that's good. You're not a zombie yet. Nope. <laughs> okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Awesome. All right. How are you, Mr. Andrew? I'm good. Just uh, in the middle of eating my lunch at the same time I'm logging into this. <laughs> yeah. Um, is everybody like, I guess, trying to like overcome the holiday, you know, into Thanksgiving and crazy busy and then coming back and just trying to get back into the swing of things? Or do we feel, do we feel good? I really didn't have much of a holiday break. There was Aww. so many crises over the we were in ended up working most of it. So bummer. Yeah, yeah. running, 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 you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like the holidays are nice and it's a break, but it's also just hard, really hard to not uh to you know to have the let's say interruption, you know, into what we're all trying to do. It's like it's like an extra thing. <laughs> Hi, Darren. You're on mute, sir. I see your lips moving, but I don't hear a thing. <laughs> Hello, Brandy. How are you? I'm good. How was your weekend? It was wonderful. Thank you. That's good. Good, good, good. I have a couple of guests here. Who's here? Hi. Who is it? <laughs> That's, remember Blaine? I know. Yeah, I and, see Blaine. Yeah. yeah. And next to him is Casey. Oh, good. Hi, Casey. Yeah, Casey just came on, I think, when I was leaving. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. We're just going to give it a couple more minutes. And I know some some other people are going to be joining a little bit later. Um, and then and then we'll get going. Um, <clears throat> um, Andrew, can you see my screen? Uh, or I mean, can, sorry, can you see my face? You got the video? Uh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you something. Hold on. Uh oh, cat. <laughs> Here's one. <laughs> that's, nice. that's, that's Sun Bear. <laughs> and then. Oh, here's another one. <laughs> nice. That's Mr. Fritz. <laughs> and then. Uh, come here. Let go. Come here. Let go. Come here. Here's another one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's my Miriam. Nice. Then, They're like triplets. How do you tell them apart? I was just going to same thing. <laughs> I, I I can tell them apart easily now. They move different. They look different. They have different fur. They have different tails. Um, yeah. I thought Mr. Peak came in here, but now I don't I don't see him. And there is a black and white one somewhere, as well. Do so you have five cats? Yeah. Wow, Catwoman. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, you for calling me cat woman instead of the cat lady. I appreciate that, Darren. Well, I'm I'm just thinking you're a superhero. Cat woman. <laughs> I know. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a super superhero for saving all these cats. You need to meet another friend of mine, Brandy. She's got five cats. Oh, I would love her. I'm sure I would love to go hang out at her house and play with her cats because over Thanksgiving, um, you know, I went to one of my friends' house and she has a new little kitty and it was like, you know, my heart just melted. I was like, oh, I miss my kitties. <laughs> just seeing another little kitty. Um, okay. 
Um, I'm down to four. So you're down to four. <laughs> four cats, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, Rondia. Thank you for joining. Okay, let's get going. So um, we have two guests today with us, everybody. It's Andrew and Kim. And uh, you can see on the screen that they both share context and individualization. So this will be really fun because we haven't really talked much about context yet in, in um, with any of our guest speakers. If I, uh, this is just in their top five strengths. If I click on this top 10 strength, you can see that they also share achiever and arranger as well as their context and, and individualization. So what we will do is um, have both of you just introduce yourselves. Andrew, we'll start with you just because you're on the left here. Um, and if you could just share with people some, you know, tell us about your story, you know, like um, what you did when you got out of high school and um, where, where, where that took you out, you know, what you did after, after that, um, how your life has evolved and like, how, you know, where you are today because of all of that. And you can also share, of course, how, how we met and came into, um, into knowing one another. And, and then we'll let Kim, you know, share with the group who, who she is and, and all that as well. So here's Andrew's LinkedIn. You guys can um, connect with him if you would like to. And Andrew, go ahead and just share um, a little bit about yourself with the group. Sure. Um, my name is Andrew Wilderks. I'm the CIO for Intrusion here in Plain Oak. Um, uh, let's see. After I graduated high school, I went to a military junior college in the hopes of getting into a service academy. Um, I got accepted to the service academy after my second year of the military junior college. Turned it down because I'd already been through two years of military school, did one another four. So I took a reserve commission and then did my follow on studies here at uh, UT Arlington, where I graduated summa cum later. It took me like seven years to graduate. <laughs> um, the only reason I finished was because the Army was going to kick me out if I didn't complete my bachelor's degree. Um, did a lot of uh, technical work, just kind of serendipitously. Um, it was, you know, early '90s, and there were jobs paying ten bucks an hour to do help desk work for uh, um, AST computers, and it worked around my school schedule. So I got into that. Uh, it evolved into a, a nice little gig with Microsoft, uh, teaching uh, Windows 95 beta support, and then um, I parlayed that into a telecom position with uh, CLEC. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that concept, but competitive local exchange carrier were the results of the breaking up of the baby bells. So I ended up in uh, networking when I found out that the router guy made twice as much as I did doing desktop support. And it never looked back since then. I uh, worked in consulting for several years and then ended up with uh, working for AT&T. Um, AT&T Labs and New Technology Introduction and Development. You might be familiar with Uverse. That was one of my babies, as well as uh, mobile video on demand. It also did advanced tech support. Um, during that period, I bounced back and forth between uh, reserve and active duty, um, multiple deployments to Central America and the Middle East. Um, as in that capacity, I was an armor officer for 17 years. And then um, I branched into this emerging functional area called uh, information operations, um, which is kind of a, a quasi science of uh, influencing populations to do or not do something. Um, in that role, I did a lot of infrastructure rebuilding in Iraq, planned executions, and uh, everything in between. And then uh, finally, I did uh, four years of modeling and simulations for the military. And then I retired from the military, uh, went, retired, took early retirement from AT&T to go into a software startup, spent two years there as director of IT before I was lured to come work for Intrusion. <laughs> I really didn't, wasn't looking, but the, the recruiter person was very persistent and very sweet. So I took a, a interview on a Saturday and second interview on the following Monday and had an offer letter in my inbox. By the time I got home from that interview, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. So I came on to Intrusion 
as the uh, VP of IT. And then within a few months was promoted to SVP of technology where I took over engineering. And then after another reorganization, I took over operations and support. And then the CEO where I've been now since, uh, since then. Awesome. And what, what is this Lord of the Sith? What does this mean on your LinkedIn profile? <laughs> well, it's, it's a kind of a dual joke. Uh, I, I think it's silly for, uh, I think uh, it came about as a result of people putting their preferred pronouns there. <laughs> is um, what am I pretending to be? Yeah. Know, here. So like, if I'm going to pretend to be something, that's what I want to pretend to be. Because the joke gotcha. is, IT staff here is that uh, I have a way of accumulating power that they find fascinating. And that's kind of the whole thing behind the Star Wars mythology is to sit, look for power and ways to get it more of it. So that's, that's funny. You, you've you morphed since since I've last looked at your LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Still a Lord. I think yeah. In my previous, uh, I think, title uh, with my software startup, I was IT overlord, just because yeah. they told us we could make up our own titles. And I thought that was, there's yeah. a lot of directors of IT, but only one IT overlord. So. Yeah, it was one of the things that attracted me to your profile when I was when I was searching for you. I was like, who is this? <laughs> this is funny. Who's the overlord? <laughs> um, exactly. any, any questions for Andrew about who he is, where he's been, what he's doing? Anybody? Thank you for your service. That's well, amazing you. to, uh, I'd love to hear more about the deployments and all that you've seen and done. So it's very cool. Happy to share it. Yeah, this was the, this was me and my boss back in the 2006 during the search. <laughs> We're still on a first name basis. He calls me Andrew and I call him sir. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Um, Kim, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, where you've been and how you got to where you are today? Yeah. Um, uh, went to out of high school, went to college and, um, ha was working my way through college at, um, I was really attracted to the retail industry. So worked for Gap, uh, the Gap. Um, for 10 years and um, was a year away from finishing school and um, had gotten married and my husband got a job in San Francisco and so we had to decide like oh are we going to spend like the first year of our marriage apart or <laughs> or together in San Francisco mm -hmm. having fun and so um, that's what we did and um, so I worked for The Gap for 10 years, which uh, really goes into my top five strengths. Uh, I did really well there, um, especially the Ranger. There's a lot of um, merchandising and marketing and, you know, all those things. Um, and then uh, kids came along and um, something interesting, like part of the story is uh we have, me and my husband have moved around a lot. So, um, we have been married, uh, 27 years. We have moved 17 times. Wow. And did I say 27 or 23 or 23 years? Sorry. We've moved 17 times in 23 years. And, um, and we've been here in grapevine for, uh, on our 12th year. So that tells you a little bit about, we moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. um, kids and family came along. And so um, I did not work outside the home besides volunteering. So I was PTA president. I was in charge of field day. I was in charge of a lot of different things um, that I loved to do and then um and then re-entered the workforce when my youngest started school and worked for a nonprofit, which was my ideal job. Um, because um, I'm sorry, Brandy, I might be stealing a little of your thunder because it, it really tied into no please the belief side of 
uh, you'll see is in my top 10, the belief side. So it really, um, it was really using all my strengths and uh, loved that job. And then moved here to Grapevine and um, started to work at a um, kind of mid-level tech company uh, called Granberry Solutions. And I was just going to be a part-time <laughs> receptionist. <laughs> and um, interviewed with the CEO and he called me, you know, right after Christmas and said, hey, would you want to do full time and do marketing and trade shows and all this other stuff? And so I was like, OK, <laughs> and um, was with them for a long time. And then um, that company sold. Uh, we sold that company and I stayed on um, a year after. Uh, to help with the transition. And then um, eventually um, the CEO that I worked for that had left started a new company and he said, hey, I need, I need, I need you here. Um, and I said, okay, but I have two kids in college, so I need more than just part-time work. And so uh, he found uh, me, Brad Stevens, who uh, I work with, and then uh, business navigators who I work with. So um, that was kind of the start of uh, Prevent then. It wasn't called that at that point. Um, I'm pretty much a reluctant entrepreneur. I am very risk adverse. I like a plan. I like everything laid out ahead of me. Um, and so two of my serial, very entrepreneurial people, Brad and Tom said, no, just do it. Uh, so that's how we got Prevent um, started, and we now have um, 12 clients and more waiting to come on board, and we have a team of six people, um, and Prevent is more than an executive assistant. We, we see ourselves as sidekicks, so, um, you know, we see entrepreneurs as heroes and every hero needs a sidekick and that's what we do and we kind of take care of all the things that a business owner would need to do but doesn't necessarily have time to do the majority of that is digital marketing um, but we do some strategy we help implement projects and help them get out of their own way a lot of the times to get things done and scale their businesses um, it's really really fun and and very much very much love it Mm -hmm. so. um, and it's still using my strengths <laughs> of context and, and my top two strengths because it's a very customized individualized approach so. yeah for, for each entrepreneur that you work with yeah. yeah yeah any any thoughts or questions for kim guys she is amazing <laughs> <laughs> yes she is <laughs> your check is in the mail <laughs> Well, I've certainly seen Kim in action in Business Navigators, and I'll tell you, she certainly does a nice job of hurting all the cats in that organization. So thank you, Kim, for all you do there. Thank you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the arranger doesn't show up in your top five, but if we look at the top 10, you can see the arranger and the achiever come into play, which I think has got to be helpful with the herding of cats job that, that she has. Yeah. Um, Okay. So Kim, you said, you know, that you feel like, you know, your top five strengths or even six, seven, eight, nine, you know, I don't, I don't, you can talk about whatever ones you want to here, but um, can you help us understand as listeners, like, which, what do you do with these strengths So you know, a lot of times people, especially around context will ask me, I love my strength of context. Cause I learned history, but I don't know what to do with it. So if you could share with us, like how you use these um, different strengths to get the job done, that would be really helpful. Um, context uh, for me is, uh, for I, I use that all day, every day, but um, it really helps me in two ways. So with my clients, it really helps me achieve what, help them achieve what they need to achieve because I have the whole story. So I have what they've done in the past and didn't work. I, so I ask questions about, and Brad will probably tell you this, I ask them a ton of questions to really try to understand um, what worked and what didn't work. And then moving forward, what, what's the end goal and, um, 
and how that will work. And then I do that with my um, my team too. You'll see developer is number three for me. So I, I really get, um, I don't know, such satisfaction of seeing people grow. Um, and so I kind of get the story of my team, um, like where they came from, but also, you know, where they want to go as well. And what, and the little details of that really help me um, help them, like help develop them. And I know how to talk to them. And, mm -hmm. um, I will say, um, the real light light bulb for me with strengthology is I was training one of our coworkers and, um, and context is my big thing. So like, I need to know the why behind why we're doing this and why that's important. And not everybody needs to know the why they just want to do it. So, um, so Brandy and I did, a, she did a mutual session with both of us. And I was like, oh, that's why your eyes were glazing over when I was telling you the strategy behind this and why this is important. And you just need to know what to do and to do it. And it saved us so much time just because we understood that and and i have really noticed that too in um my conversations with people they don't need necessarily all the details and if they want details they will ask, ask for them so um yeah so i don't know if that that answers yeah and that. and it's different people have different ways of learning so um one of the things i'm actually working on behind the scenes for strengthology is to be able to uh, allow you guys to read through some of that where it's like, okay, so someone with context is going to need a lot of context, right? The whole history in order to stay engaged and to learn something. Because if you skip past that, they, they'll disengage. Mm -hmm. Where um, someone with communication actually learns by communicating. So when they're learning, you actually have to let them talk, which is kind of like, you're kind of going, well, how are they going to learn anything if they're talking? That's how they learn is talking, is talking through it out loud. Um, somebody else might be a learner like myself, right? Where I learn by, I want to learn at my pace. That's probably the achiever as well. And I want to learn. And when my brain, when it clicks with my brain, I'm ready for the next question. And I want to ask the question. And I want to be, I want somebody to be clicking along at mine. Cause I'm only going to ask what I need to know. I'm not going to ask about the stuff I already know. Um, so to give me the context and all the details, I'm like, I don't, I don't need to know all that. Right. There's certain pieces I already know. <laughs> so I'm not engaged if I'm having to sit in there, listen to something that I already know where my brain gets engaged is when I'm learning something new, which is the learner piece. So, um, it's, it's fascinating how even in like in that relationship that you were talking about where, you know, you're the teacher and someone else is the, the trainee, how important it is to understand someone's learning style and to understand your own teaching style in, in that moment. Because I think one of the toughest things about strengths is to stay a t um, authentic to who you are, but to also have to adapt or adjust to someone else's style if you want it to work for them, which may not be your own style. Now, I think with individualization, that's actually very satisfying for you, Kim, where you, you go, oh, this is my style. This is what I would need. However, it's not working for you. It's not your style. So I'm happy to adjust and adapt to make it work for you because that's actually a part of your personality. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would just add, I'm the terrible person at the movie. My it drives my husband crazy because I'm like, well, why did they do that? Like what happened to them that they want to do that? And where do you think they, you know, like I want all those details and that's yeah. why I love sequel. Like I love, um, the Marvel series because it's like the whole story. Like I uh -huh. have the, I've watched all the star Wars and they're like, it's, they're terrible. And I'm like, I don't care. I want to know all the details of all the stories. So anyway. Super interesting. So, um, Andrew, we'll flip over to you. Um, do you relate with anything that Kim was saying? <laughs> yeah, that's, it's actually kind of funny. I mean, if you look at my chart, it's, it's a little bit less about relationship building than, than hers and it's influencing, which kind of goes to that whole thing of leadership. You know, you know, 
every single job I've ever had within a matter of days, if not weeks, I'm kind of, you know, my influence takes over, if you will, and I end up kind of a de facto leader of, of whatever group I'm in. And it's, I'm happy to sit back in, in most cases, but it just grates on me. And then I start, you know, when things are ineffective. So uh, I've done a million of these, you know, different types of, you know, strengths and weaknesses or whatever they call them, constraints or whatever. But uh, the thing that makes logical sense about this is don't try to make somebody into something they're not and play to what you're good at. And I went back and reviewed my career and all the organizations I've been in and the ones I've led or were followers in. And, and honestly, I thought for the longest time, I was just incredibly lucky to just end up with some great people. But then after going through this and then putting it back into context, I realized that I was subconsciously <laughs> arranging and building the teams to suit my own needs, which kind of that, that executing and made them a high performing group. So it was a, it was almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy that, you know, I, you know, weeded out people that fit, didn't fit into the mindset and then added in people who did to actually accomplish the goal. You know, and I think that's one of the things people point out is that I um, even hear multiple times that I've brought in people to the company to, to, for one role and said, you know, give them a shot here and was told, no, they, they don't fit. And then found another role and then they've exploded and you know found the job that suited their individual strengths and they're all very high performers within the company and achieved a lot of a recognition for their individual efforts and their team playing ability mm -hmm. so yes go the ahead. other okay oh, sorry go ahead oh the other groups have actually taken my uh my interview questions and and they're incorporating them in their hiring because remarkably the people that can go through those questions and interpret the results actually have a much higher success rate than people who don't even even when dealing with agency hires um out of all the candidates that go through the ones that go through and the what's now the known as a technology screening process um they tend to be more productive there's a uh, higher retention rate and it just seems to be a, a, a ripple effect. So, um, okay, so two things. One, we're going to come back to your questions because I know there's people on this call that are really interested in that. Um, but two, let's go back to what you just said because you said, you know, from an individualization standpoint, you are learning about the individual, you're catering the way that you interact with them, that you are trying to find them, you know, like where they need to sit in the organization and maybe even who they need to be partnered up or paired with on certain teams to be you know, their most productive selves. Um, and that's really the heart of individualization. But then I also heard you say that you rearrange them. You know, if it's not working, you're you're able to quickly rearrange them and move them around. And that I think is that individualization arranger combination, who I know there's several people on this call that also have that, and they do that very naturally. They're 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 not, they don't give up on people. They just find they know that there's a place for them. It's just a matter of finding where they belong. And then I heard the achiever really come out when you're just talking about, you know, um, high performers and performance and individualization cares about performance. A ranger cares about efficiency, but achiever is really about delivery, right? And getting things done. So now, I, you know, I start to hear, okay, we, you know, we're learning these people, we're putting them in the right place. And it's all to the point of being productive and delivering something and achieving um, an overall goal or purpose. But how does the context um, how does the context play into that for you? <laughs> it's interesting though. When I was in a uh, consulting role, I had to learn real quick not to make snap judgments. You know, you, you go into a place and you see that things from your point of view just look like an absolute train wreck. And you ask yourself, you know, who the hell bought this up? You know, how did this come about? And then when you place yourself in that person's shoes, and put them in the situation they had with the choices they had available at the time and the level of knowledge and resources they had, it becomes perfectly logical. And so you 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 tend to you have to be a lot less emotional about things and look at the card hard cold facts of what put them there. And 
when you do that, it becomes a lot easier to visualize. Okay, yeah, I would have done the same thing. Oh, yeah, that's not too big a mistake at this point. And when it comes to getting things done, you know, it, um, back to the achiever and arranger, you you have to put aside your your own ego and your own emotions towards you know achieving what has to be done. And so putting things in context makes it a lot easier to remove the emotional part of, of those judgments and decisions and just focus on getting the result, which is my last three of these, I'll say the same thing, not particularly bright, not particularly energetic, but just has a way of getting things done yeah, yeah, <laughs> far and above his peers. <laughs> it, it's fascinating that you say this because you're not the first context person I've met that says that the one of the main objectives of their context is to understand, um, which to me is more of an empathy trait, right? If you really want to understand the whole context and the whole situation so that you can be compassionate and so that you can um, be forgiving, right, of w- whatever the situation is, but just, just it's like, it's like it turns into just straight up understanding, which is usually more of like, you, you, or you would think you would think of it as like an empathy trait, right? Someone who's just really compassionate, really understanding, really accepting. Um, I, I also know that with your includer, um, that, that is closer to empathy. So I'm going to show people this because I don't know if they've studied includer a lot. Let's go to includer really quick. Um, so includers, you guys can see it are, you know, Andrew's a softy. He really, really cares for people. He makes sure that no one is excluded. Everyone is, is included. And you can imagine if everyone in the company is included in his arrangements and in delivery and, you know, being placed in the right spot, then he does such a good job of this. He has very engaged, loyal teams. Um, and you can see that it talks about how, you know, they are non-judging. They're very, very accepting. Um, they don't like to hurt people's feelings and they believe that everyone is equally important and everyone should feel important, included, accepted, involved. Um, and so I think, I think, I think we're getting a little bit of a mix too, um, of the includer when you're talking about the context and the ways that you're saying that you do it in order to, to understand people and have compassion for them. And then on top of it, we have the um, individualization, which I think again, is making you want to, I'm sorry, I'm struggling with my, you know, all, all these zoom things. And then they put, you know, all the zoom bars everywhere and you can never get them in the right spot to function on a screen. Um, but I think what we're also hearing is that mix of context and individualization, which is get the history of the, the person in the situation to understand them and their, um, perspective and why they did what they did because I we've had another conversation on on these calls about individualization how how they feel very very empathetic because they are so intuitively in tune with people and their psychology and their motivations um and if they have other strengths that make them also just really care about the person then it it starts to come out come out that way like like includer for example um Anyway. One of the interesting things, there's a there's a course at the War College. Um, it's called Red Teaming. And it basically forces you to look at things from another perspective, not so much to get inside someone's decision cycle and say, if I do X, they're going to do Z. It's more of if I do A, this is how they're going to perceive it based upon their big five. So when you're doing what's called human terrain mapping, you look at how someone identifies themselves and use that to arrange how you're going to change their mindset or influence them. So like when someone talks about me, you know, what are five phrases or words that you would use to describe me? And based upon those answers, you can individualize your approach towards approaching that person. So like when I look at Brandy, you know, okay, she, I, I look female, right? Um, uh, big brain mathematics. I mean, that just blows my mind. Uh, Athletic, um, very energetic. And then, you know, um, entrepreneurial, those are how I would define Brandy Mm -hmm. and how Brandy defines herself. I look for an overlay between those two things and then kind of mesh those two belief systems towards 
getting an approach to influence Brainy towards what I think she should or shouldn't be doing. And you do that for entire populaces too. And it becomes a really interesting exercise where you don't have to fully crock somebody, which if you're not a science fiction fan, that's you gain such an understanding of something that it becomes a part of you, but you get enough of it to where you can predict the perceptions of how things are going to be received. It makes it much easier to get a predictable result out of someone's performance. Yeah. So um, Andrew and I have actually worked together and um, there were, there were a couple of things that I thought was interesting about working with you. Of course, you know, the way that you work with your teams and other people and, and what the, some of the stuff you've already described, but from an individual interaction with you, there were two things that really stuck out to me. One was whenever I asked Andrew, if he could help me with something or help us get something done as a team, he did it immediately he was all over it. He was on it. It was important. And he just made sure that he was already moving on it before I could walk out the door. Um, and that to me was different to work with because, um, some people move fast, but your, your sense of service, I think to another person and, and the, the importance you place on what they valued was kind of different for me. Um, and I was like, I wonder if he moves this fast on everybody's stuff or is if he's doing that as an, individualization mechanism, right? For me, because you know, I like to move fast and it, and it drove a lot of respect from me. Um, and then the other thing that I, I thought was fascinating is you're, you're an includer, which is kind of the opposite of relator, right? Relator is like one-on-one -on -one, exclusive. If you're my people, I relate with you and I, and I want to hang out with you. If not, then I'm, I'm just not really interested. And so I'm more of a relator. You're, you're inclusive. You're like, everybody matters and, and everybody should be included and everybody should feel a part of the community. Um, but what I noticed with you is that the way that you would include me as an individual was through my relator, which I just found fascinating. So you guys, Andrew would come into my, my office and he'd be like, Hey, my, you know, lovely wife cooked a roast beef or whatever. What was that that she cooked? That was so great. Oh, beef burgundy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and he would walk in and he's like, are you hungry? Cause you know, we didn't eat, you know, we were struggled to eat around there cause we were so busy. Um, and he was like, do you want some of this? And he'd shut the door and we'd have our one-on-one -on -one meeting and we'd split it and we'd have our, our lunch one-on-one -on -one time. And I was like, does he know this is this effective? Like, I just feel like this was like such a nice thing. One to share your lunch. And number two, he's including me because I can, I can kind of set myself apart from, because I'm very introverted and I like one-on-one -on -one stuff. Um, but he was, he still was able to extend an arm of inclusion, but in the way that I would want to be included. I, I found that fascinating. Did you know that you were doing that or did you just like go, this just seems to be what, what she enjoys. <laughs> It's one of those things I've done it so often. I don't even think about it. Okay. And my wife pointed out to me too, that it's, it's just part of my, what, what she calls co-opting behavior. Whenever I'm trying to, you know, work with someone, I'm trying to learn more about them. That's kind of like one of the first things I do is find what they're, what's up, something that appeals to them and just keep reinforcing that. And <laughs> yeah. So it's a habit now. I don't even think about it. Yeah. It, it was just fascinating because, um, I think also like the speed at which you pick up on people's preferences and what they like and what works for them and how they like to be engaged is impressive. Um, and then, like you said, how you execute on it right away. And then you also then reinforce it. Um, and, and the other thing that Andrew did really good, by the way, guys, was his communication through email. Um, he would provide so much context to everybody, but also it was in a strategic, meaningful way that you could, you could read these emails that had, you know, five, six paragraphs and find them very interesting and formative. They were always inclusive of everybody on the teams, as well as inclusive of different aspects of what appealed to people, their emotions, the, the deliverables. Um, he always seemed to master like what they cared about, like a whole group of people, what the whole group cared about in a, in a single email. Um, so that was another thing that I felt like, you know, kind of comes out of you honing in on your strengths and understanding how to use them to uh, to lead others. Um, <laughs> any, any thoughts or questions for either Kim or Andrew, anybody? 
One of the things I noticed about Andrew as well is, I, and it's similar to my own trait, which is probably why I picked up on it. Um, he's got the maximizer uh, strength as well. And I think when you're arranging people and you're trying to maximize their contribution so that they do explode, as you mentioned earlier, um, into something that uh, is pretty powerful. I think that's a great trait. Um, and, and I'm just curious, how, how do you go about that, Andrew, from your perspective? How do you uh, leverage those two strengths in particular? Because that would be fascinating to me is because I share those with you. You know, it, it's funny. Um, I don't really look at people's uh, stated talents. Like if you told me you're a very fast runner, I rarely take that into consideration. I, I look more at um, personality and look at their wants, needs, desires. Mm -hmm. And then I, I do regular one-on-ones, which is very draining for me because that requires me to, 62% uh, of the company reports to me. So I'm doing over half the company one-on-ones for half an hour to an hour to kind of pull that out of people. I mean, it's more of a casual conversation, but it at the surface, but if you're looking into it, it's very interrogatory. So there's a lot of people that, you know, came to me that one person I looked at to hire was a, a UI programmer. And that's what they said they were. That's what they wanted to do. And then as I started talking to them more, oh, you're a trained paralegal. Oh, also you've got a background in graphic design and your ADHD in on the autism spectrum. <laughs> well, you know, long story short, after trying and failing uh, twice to find them a, a home here, they you know, went into the marketing side of the house and most of the products like in our blogs and our new logos and all that was all her work. Um, so it's um, it's really just kind of a, like Brandy said, it's it do the whole related, relating to them to, you know, find out who they really are versus who they, they say they are on paper. And then when you can, you know, dig into that, it, it makes it very easy to, to figure out where they can contribute the best you know, for the, both their benefit and yours. That's a great example. Thanks, Andrew. Mm -hmm. So I had a quick question for Andrew. What earlier yeah. you had mentioned some kind of human mapping or something like that. What did you call that? Mm -hmm. Human train mapping. Human train mapping? Terrain. Like terrain. Yeah, you know, in the military, you know, you're you're thinking from the context of, of military operations, you, you always want the high ground, right? Or, and you're looking for uh, blind spots or what they call avenues of approach when you're planning military and logistics operations. Human terrain mapping is not much different when you're, you know, you're dealing with non-lethal fires. It's more about things you want to say or communicate. So you have to figure out who your audience is and how to engage them properly. And so you wouldn't talk to an 80-year-old grandmother the same way you would deal with, you know, an 18-year-old you know, high school student. So you you look at the group of people, you kind of look at what it's going to appeal to the largest amount and influence that and then deal with your outliers as they as they fall out. So it's a it's it's definitely evolved to a science and there's some very skilled professionals in it. Um, I'm not sure if the uh, in, I know from the military standpoint, it's it's illegal for uh, the U.S. military to do it with, to U.S. citizens, but I see that type of process being applied by <laughs> marketing agencies all the time. And I recognize the handiwork, even in press releases, I'm like, wow, they got a really good person working for them. I wonder if that, you know, when they graduated from the from the same course I went to. And what, so is that not in the general public, but only in the military? Is that what you're telling us? Um, I think there's a civilian component of it because I see a lot of people. Um, that are in the IO realm and their civilian jobs, they work in you know, marketing and things like that. So I'm sure if if I if I delved enough into research into a lot of marketing companies, they're using a lot of the same techniques and that uh, that the military uses. It's just you know, federal law makes it illegal for the military to do it. <laughs> and and is there any like resource like that? that you know of that we we could all go read about to learn more about that 
Um, that's not illegal. Yeah. Well, there's. I think well, the, we don't have to join the army for. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the field manual for for io and for uh, terrain mapping i think is actually non-classified so you could probably google it um and pull it up and you can download it in pdf format but you know if it's not classified i'm happy to you know, provide you the materials and, that i have to <laughs> and, and what does io stand for information operations oh okay so okay. in information operations are actually what i call shaping a reality because it combines um, psychological operations, you know, psyop, psychological warfare, with um, civil affairs, which are the guys that go out and hand out toys to children and and give out free medical care. Um, you're coordinating that with physical destruction, you know, military operations are, where people are going in and kicking in doors because, you know, how you kill somebody actually sends just as strong a message as how you is everything else. And then, yeah. um, let's see, there's the um, there's seven pillars total, but uh, computer network attack and defense, um, controlling you know information flows to people, what messages they they'll see versus what they don't see. So you're doing all these things to shape a reality for somebody, or you know, a whole population. It could be something as small as a, a village, or as large as a multiple tribes, or an entire country. But you know, if you can go back and look at um, Google, like the Lincoln Group. That was a, a company that we had outsourced to plant you know, favorable news articles and in world publications because they were get, delivering carefully crafted messages to certain segments of world population to influence people's perceptions of you know the, the war in Iraq, for instance. But then we were backing that up with other things. I mean, I um, you know rebuilding economies to remove the the influence of al-qaeda's uh, hold over fuel and power um, another case in point is we did uh, operations where we contracted uh, um, pharmaceutical companies to to buy up all the opium crops so uh, narco-terrorism would lose their source of funding you know those types of things but it's all tricky because you have to manage not just the the nuts and bolts but how people are going to perceive that Mm -hmm. and reinforce the good parts of it to keep people supporting those types of things yeah yep that's fascinating um so i'm gonna i'm gonna jump over to compare you and kim really quick but while i'm doing that can you also share with the team like can you ask them a question that you would ask in an interview so they can hear your style of in interviewing as well <laughs> i'll ask the big four so the, okay. the first question that asks is always a throwaway and it's just a fun one it throws them off balance, but it's uh, uh, imagine you're a serial killer. Um, based on your demo, what nickname does the press give you? Um, you know, it's really kind of funny because what I do find from a, 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 a cultural perspective is people from Southwest Asia will almost never answer the question because they don't want to relay anything negative about themselves to a potential boss. Um, so it, it kind of pulls a little bit of honesty out of folks. Um, the other ones that I ask for is uh, you can choose between superpowers, between flight and invisibility, which would you pick? You know, uh, uh, it's kind of an introvert, extrovert question. You always want your salespeople to choose flight. You know, um, people that are leaders, you know, you know we're going to be leading a team, definitely need to be flight. If it's invisibility, that they're, they're generally not going to do well. Um, my, my most famous one that people really hate to answer is the Cassandra question. Uh, Cassandra was from Greek mythology. She made a deal with the gods to get the ability to see the future. And then she reneged on her half of the deal. But rather than take the gift back, they cursed her to say, okay, you still can see the future perfectly, but no one will ever believe you. So as a result, she became universally reviled. Everybody hated her because you know she was the one that said, beware of Greeks bearing gifts of the Trojan War. And, um, you know, you saw how that turned out. But so the Cassandra question is, would you rather be Cassandra always right, but universally reviled or always wrong, but you get along with everybody? You know, your, your perfect engineer will always be Cassandra. He doesn't care if you like him or not. He wants to be right. Whereas a salesperson, you know, or a marketing person is the anti-Cassandra. They're okay with being wrong as long as they keep that relationship. So, um that's usually a very telling question about people. Then um, uh, 
the other one where you we ask off and on depending upon the how the rest of the interview goes is the if you can take any technology that exists today back to any point place and era in time what do you take and where do you take it 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 kind of relays how a if the person's selfish or not um, and their motivations and b it also tells you if they're good at resolving second and third order effects in their decision making you know case in point this person was very good hearted and they said i would take antibiotics back to the time of the plague and you know if you were you're thinking contextually about this is like okay now instead of destroying you know 60 percent of europe's population which laid the groundwork for the renaissance now you've overpopulated europe with a bunch of dumb people <laughs> um, <so. laughs> yeah uh, it, it, those kinds of questions you know you, you 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 kind of you know use a lot of your skills here to kind of extract what what's very telling about the candidate to see how successful they're going to be in the different roles and so for an engineer that's a very important question um you know some people will oh there's a certain margin that always wants to go back and give themselves godlike powers you know i'll take electricity back to the ancient egypt and i'll, I'll be worshipped you know or yeah you know, other people are the knowledge seekers. I'll, I'll take a camera back to, you know, the Tower of Babel and see if it really existed. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it really tells you about their what their real motivation is. So, well, I hate to psychoanalyze by you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> no, he has really good intent, Brad. It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Kim. <laughs> <laughs> So um, as we look at their their two strengths, uh, sets of strengths here, what, what do you guys see? What's similar? What's different? What are your observations? We, I mean, we see both learner strategic responsibility right there at 9, 10, 11, 11, 12, and 13 for these guys. We see that they have a ranger achiever. Individualization and context, all the same. Um, it's, belief, it, is, belief is high for Kim. Yeah, but belief is really high for Kim and low for Andrew. Her empathy is way high compared to mine too. <laughs> and developer. And we usually see empathy developer. Those two are usually close together. So that, that's a normal response. Like if you have one, then you probably have the other somewhere close by. What's weird about yours, Andrew, is that the harmony strategic, because those are usually opposites. Uh, most strategic people are very... They're not conflict oriented, but they don't mind conflict at all. Like they're happy to have the conflict where harmony people are um, far more conflict diverse, don't want the conflict, would like for us to peacefully have the discussion and, you know, will have the conflict if they need to, but it's not something that they thrive on. And with your harmony includer, it means overall um, you enjoy, you know, a peaceful situation, a kind um balanced you know uh, well not necessarily balanced i guess that's the wrong word um but you know just it doesn't have to have a lot of conflict for you to be effective you know, and i've seen you in action you don't mind conflict but and i that's probably because you have strategic and some of these other things um but you you know it seems like you prefer um to do things in a peaceful way rather than a conflictual way yes most people don't understand that before i go into meeting where there's a decision to be made, I already talked to most of the people before the meeting and got their acquiescence before I go into that. <laughs> so uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, I've resolved my conflicts with them to gotcha. go into the meeting and everyone appeals. It's yeah. like, oh yeah, this is a great idea. Let's go with that. Joe's always fascinated by it. He's, mm -hmm. he's He says, you're awesome at managing up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think individualization is great at managing up, down, sideways, around because they just know how to cater to that person. Doesn't position doesn't matter, right? It's just a matter of um, figuring out how to interact effectively with another person. And and I also see that Kim, you have deliberative, which means that you're going to be far more cautious, careful, like you said, risk averse. Um, you know, you're not comfortable with risk like a st strategic person might be, although you have strategic at 11, but your deliberative is higher. Um, and, and for deliver Andrew, deliberative is very low. It's clear at the bottom. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> with empathy, <right? laughs> so I got to imagine that's a huge difference between the two of you is that Andrew makes quick 
just like he said, he does make quick decisions. He's had to actually slow those down to be effective. Where Kim, you probably take your time and are very conscientious and deliberate about your decisions. Is that true for you? It's I take a long time to decide. Mm -hmm. But when you make a decision, it's a very good decision and you probably keep the decision. Is that also a correct assumption? Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, the belief part is a big part of everything I do. So if I don't believe, uh, if I don't believe in what we're doing, if I don't believe that your intentions are good, if I don't believe your story, if I don't believe that I have a really hard time moving forward. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it has to align. <laughs> and do you have an example of when you were really, really, really struggling with that. Cause I'm sure there's, there's, there's times where you're struggling with that. And then whatever you're thinking or believing comes true. And you're like, see, I told you. Right. But what about the opposite? Has there ever been times where your belief was just really pulling at you and it was nagging you and it was like pulling you away from the situation or the person, but then something changed and you were able to then believe in them or believe in what they were doing or to see their their side of it um no <laughs> <laughs> i've got <laughs> thank you for your honesty kim does honesty come no. number one <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm probably like the engineer no there's a writing it no um no i've tried I've, i'm like going through like like when i left the gap because they changed they changed their values. They changed how they did stuff. They changed a lot of things and I did not align with me. And I went from being very successful to not as successful, but mainly because I was very unhappy there because I did, it did not align with what I felt like the gap was about. And so, which is context, right? That's like, just, it's all context. Like here's the history. This is what we're about. And then it changed and not for the better, in my opinion. And so I left and I immediately was, it was just so much better, but that didn't like me staying there would have been not great for me at all. Yeah. yeah. Because of it didn't, it didn't a lot. It, yeah. So that was the big one. That was a big one. Cause I was there 10 years. I was on a trajectory. I was on, you know, there were some things there and, um, yeah. I mean, I ran a, I ran a $30 million gap store. So like, it was, it was fun, <laughs> but that changed and Yeah. So it has to have that. I have to have that. Yeah. Otherwise I don't function well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. So, so that's interesting on Kim, that that's the number one spot at the very beginning of her pattern. Yes. Now. Yes. Because it's really going to be her direction setter, right? Like if I believe in this, I will do it. I will go this direction. If I don't believe in it, I, I cannot go that direction. I cannot, I cannot follow. I cannot lead. I cannot do it. And, and in fact, on teams, um, what you'll see is like, like, let's say she's leading a team like she, she does today. Um, she will say, this is what we as a team believe in. These are our core values. Like that piece of it doesn't get missed by Kim because that piece is essential of who are we, what are we about? What do we believe in? How do we act? How do we, you know, behave or treat others? Like all of that matters, you know, the, the integrity part of it, any, anything, anything that she believes in is going to, is going to direct the team that, you know, you, you can't be on Kim's team without kind of settling into what she believes in, if that makes sense. You can't even be a client of Kim if you're not. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm sorry. Did I throw that out and, there? <laughs> and she's good at adapting her interactions and her behavior to cater towards other people. Um, so she's not like so structured that she can't adapt or change because she has individualization, but to the, it's like that core, the core stuff has to be there. And then once that's there, then she's very happy to adapt and change and make it work for you and accepting and, you know, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, if there's something off with that core part, then that's, that's a no-go. Yeah, it really is. 
Yeah. I mean, it's a pattern. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if it's good or bad, but it is my Well, pattern. it just, it is what it is. And it's just, yeah. it's, you know, we all have different facets to our personalities. That is just your stubborn part, right? It's just the part where you're like, no, not okay. <laughs> That's my boundary. <laughs> you know, like, hey, and I, I can tell problem. you from my standpoint, we value that greatly. Yeah. It's, yeah. Cause there's a lot of intuition with that that comes with that too. Right. A little mm-hmm. spidey's going off, right? Yeah. Or child, you know, childhood dysfunction. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, we all have that. It all plays out. Um, and then yeah. the other thing that we notice here, right, is Andrew's communication maximizer is a bit higher, which is the orangey, the orangey orange. So Kim is probably a little less comfortable with influence where Andrew's pretty com- probably pretty comfortable with it. Anything? Let's look at the bottom. Should we look down here? Yeah. So we have all my oranges. At the all bottom. The, I was just going to say all your oranges down at the bottom. <laughs> this is why you're paired up with Tom. <laughs> yeah. And Brad. Yeah. 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 And then, and then poor Andrew is not consistent or disciplined, you know, <laughs> he's, he, he has a huge lack of structure. <laughs> Makes him a great leader. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm still doing my list. So. <laughs> well, and what's interesting is like you have, yeah, you make your list and then you also have a ranger, which is flexible organization. So you are structured in some ways, but you're also very, very flexible and adaptable in your approach to your organization which I think is just great when you're running a huge operation. Um, like where for me, my consistency discipline is so high that I can be a little too planned, structured, you know, schedules, you know, stuff like that. That's a survival trait. Any officer will tell you that no plan survives first contact. So mm. the perfect plan is perfect until that first bullet gets fired and then it just all goes to... It's yeah. Like, um, and I think for me personally, I like, I've had to learn that versus that being natural where it seems more natural to you. Yeah. Anything else that you guys are notice or anything else you guys want to ask these two, we, you know, both fascinating individuals. That was a quick hour, wasn't it? It does go by fast. I, th- I think I appreciate the context strength a lot more, though. I didn't really understand what that was until we kind of got into some examples and how they're how uh, Kim and Andrew are using that strength. So okay. that's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I'm glad that was helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else, everybody? Okay. Well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Kim. I really, really appreciate you guys being here today with us. Um, and, uh, if you guys don't mind, I will post this to YouTube for other people to listen to in the future. If you do mind, just let me know offline and I won't post it. Um, but otherwise I hope you all have a wonderful week. Thank Thank you. Thank you. you. Take care. We'll see you next week. All right. Thanks. Yep. Bye-bye.